Hi, I'm Karen Hearn. Welcome to Don't Lecture Me. I'm here with Kevin Wilson, the author of a, a collection of short stories called Tunneling to the Center of the Earth. Kevin, welcome to Jackson, and oh. welcome to Don't Lecture Me. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, tell me, how, how much time spans the, all of these different stories? Um, I started writing these stories about 10 years ago uh, when I was an undergraduate at Vanderbilt University and have been steadily writing them. Maybe it's over a period of about eight years before I finally had enough for a collection. Okay. So yeah, so a lot of these stories are are pretty old stories. They feel very young to me. Well, that's very interesting that, that it takes so much time or they've been written over such a long period of time because they still sound like the same voice. Oh, thank you. you. Know? Um, so what's the most recent one in the collection? Um, the most recent one is um, worst case scenario, uh, which is the last story in the collection, mm -hmm. uh, and that I think that's the most recent one that I wrote. And that's your favorite, right? That is my favorite, yeah. What Probably because it? it was the newest of them. Okay, yeah. so it's just fresh in your mind. It was, and and again, like it, it just, um, I, I was really just excited about what was going on in the story, and that I was, I felt like I was doing something that was interesting to me and new to me, and and so it was kind of thrilling to write it, yeah. Okay. Another uh, underlying theme is you take a pretty normal situation and right. add something a little quirky or unusual, right. or, you know, some some might even say sci-fi, just a little yeah. a little bit of weirdness. Do you ever? Uh, I was thinking about this. I, I look at Reuters online, mm -hmm. you know, to check the news. Do you ever look at the oddly enough section? Oh yeah, like the news of the weird and yeah, things yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah, and that's actually. The, there's a story in here that's Museum of Whatnot, mm -hmm. and there used to be this thing, I think it was online, it's called News of the Weird, and they would pick out the strangest news articles, and, and there was one about William Saroyan, the writer who had bequeathed his papers to a university in California, and at the same time, he said they had to take, in addition to his papers, his paper clips and rocks and all of okay. this detritus that he had saved up over his whole life, and I thought, oh, how wonderful, and that's actually what spurred the story Museum of Whatnot. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm constantly kind of looking for those those tiny little weird moments to play with, yeah, right. for sure. And then I read somewhere that you start with one particular image, right? And then sort of write a story around it. But would you say that the image is ever, um, you know, like a support beam? Is it ever something really substantial, or does it become something sort of in the background by the time the story's done? Yeah, it just depends on when I when I'm working on it. Sometimes that thing that I thought was the most important image in the story becomes less than that, uh, it, something else takes over and the story becomes its own thing, but it's always with some sort of image or a line. For instance, when, when I thought about uh, what that would really mean for William Saroyan when he donated all this stuff after he had died, what it would mean to have these bags and bags of like rocks and paper clips, and that was the image that stuck in my head, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to write something off of that image, and that ends up being one of the very last things in the story that occurs, but for me when I started it was the most important thing. It was the thing that got the story started. The Dead Sister Handbook. Yes. It starts in the middle and ends unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the words it goes to and from, but did you conceive of a whole book or how did, I, how I did, did you I, that? I thought that I would write this entire handbook of this mm -hmm. guide for sensitive boys and I thought, okay, I'll write the whole thing. Um, and I started jotting down words, you know, that I would use. What are the, all the different words from A to Z? And it just seemed like they kept piling up in that in that kind of M N L area, mm -hmm. it just that's just the way it worked out, and so I, I just had more to work with. So I said I'll start here, and since it's it's going to be in volumes anyways, that I can go back to them. And then and then what I realized is when I had this bunch of words, they started to work as a narrative. And then I thought, okay, well, it's just going to be a little. This will be a story instead of a giant, useless handbook. <laughs> um, and so it ended up working out that way. But at first, I was just grabbing words and writing and keeping you know scraps of paper with words on them of what I was going to use. Okay. And it just happened that they bunched up. Well, it's it's brilliant, like that, like unfinished, oh, but you. referencing things that aren't that will occur, yeah, 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 yeah at other points in the book. Happened, and yeah. I was like, oh, do I need to find the book <laughs> that was before this to find the beginning of the story? So many of your stories ended sort of open-endedly, mm -hmm. and it left the reader to decide perhaps how the story would end. Did you mean to do that? What were you? I did. I, you know, I think the best example of this is there's the story "Birds in the House," and I actually was talking about this with. I visited a workshop in North Carolina recently and some students were asking me questions and she said, you know, the, the story ends before it should end. And she goes, you know, I didn't know what to think about the ending because the contest isn't over yet. There's this contest and I end it right before the moment that you would learn who the winner was. And she said that was kind of 
uh, strange to her and she wanted to know who the winner was. And f for me, it ended at just the right point because I wasn't interested in the winner of the contest. I was interested in the small boy learning about the way in which even within a family there is hatred and unhappiness and um, that just because you are made of the same genetic material doesn't mean that you love each other. And the boy realizes this moments before the contest ends. And so for me, that was the important thing that I wanted to end on. Now for some readers, that wasn't the most important thing. They wanted to know who won the contest. But for me, I stopped it at the point that I felt like I had done the thing that I had set out to do. It's not always the correct ending. It's not always the place that the actual story would end. But for me, it's the place where, where I feel like I've done the thing that I need to do. And, and I'm going to let these characters go on, keep living, but just not in this story. Right. Yeah. Well, and it seems like also if you finished it, people would still be upset with, uh, one or way still or the could other. be upset, yeah, right. one way or the other. So. Yeah. Now, why are you writing a novel and not more short stories? Um, I thought you were like the champion of the short story. I do love short stories, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I really do want to try my hand at something longer. I want to see if I can do it, and, and I love novels, too, and, and, and a lot of the works that have influenced me have been novels, and so I, I really want to try my hand at it and see if I can do it. And, and plus, when I signed the book contract, with Echo, it was a two-book deal, and the second book was a novel. So okay. it just happened to work out that I wanted to do it, but they mm -hmm. also wanted me to do it. Um, and the novel that I'm working on right now is 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 similar in some ways to the stories in that it's it takes place. It's a it's a brother and a sister um, who uh, their parents were semi-famous performance artists, and they're still alive, but they're not as popular anymore. And the children were a part of these performances, unwilling parts of these performances, and their lives were kind of, their childhood was kind of ruined because of it. And now they're adults, and they have these kind of lonely lives where they can't figure out how to live correctly because of the weird childhood that they had. And now their parents have just gone missing, and they are deciding to go try and find them. Okay. And that's, that's basically kind of the span of the novel. But it's these, again, it's these children shaped by weird experiences, which is kind of what I seem to love to do. Right. Yeah. And, but you're still working on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I've still got a long way to go. Do you know when it will be available? Uh, I'm, I turned it in in October of this year, so, so hopefully early 2011, maybe. Okay. Seems like. Okay. Well, good. Congratulations. Oh, thank I, you so I much. wish you very much success with this and with your novel. No, oh, thanks. Kevin Wilson, author of uh, Tunneling to the Center of the Earth. Thank you for being with us here on Don't Lecture Me. Oh, thank you very much for having me.